some of us were at a international quinoa conference in Ibarra about a month ago and the global Congress. And, and when I was there, one of the best talks I heard was from Didier Bazil. And it, it, it dealt a lot with germplasm issues we were discussing earlier. So I think it'll be a great talk. I'm really looking forward to it myself because Didier gave the talk last time in Spanish. So I think I understood about half of it this time. Are you going to speak in French? No. <laughs> yes, in French. I think English this time. Um, <laughs> so with that, Didier, if you could Thank go you. ahead and start. So I'm French. I'm, I'm working at CIRAD. It's an agriculture international research center for development. And I am working about quinoa for, for eight years. And uh, I'm completely agree with Tanya that the language of quinoa is Spanish, but uh, as Kevin asked me, I will give you my conference in English. I will try. So I will hope you, I hope you can understand my English. I will speak about the diversity of quinoa and its global expansion at world level. And it's important for us to speak about biodiversity before speaking about its development to understand the all the first question during the conference of Tanya, because very, there are many challenges about uh, exchanges of geoplasts at world level. The first thing is about uh, the recognition at world level of the quinoa. And the General Assembly of United Nations declared this year the International Year of Quinoa, recognizing that through their knowledge and practices, Indian indigenous people have maintained, controlled, protected, and preserved in its natural state quinoa, including its numerous land races and local crop world relative as food for present and future regeneration. And the main objective of the International Year of Quinoa is to focus world attention not only on quinoa, but on the potential role of quinoa biodiversity in food security, in nutrition, and in poverty eradication. And it's important to understand what is quinoa biodiversity to understand this potential to the development of quinoa worldwide. Through the presentation, I will relate to the complex process of creating quinoa from different white parents to explain not only the domestication, but the major stage of its history, considering the genetic aspect of evolutionary dynamics from white relative, from white quinoa, from the domestication of quinoa, from the, uh, when quinoa was rejected by the Spanish, and now, the quinoa is recognized worldwide. And it's important to understand all these steps to understand the future of quinoa. We can look at this image from, it's an adaptation of work from Rick Jell, it's here, and it will speak about uh, the relation between white parents this afternoon, but one important thing is that the phylogenetic relationship between cultivated and the relate white taxa have been studied on the basis of arosin study, possibility, DNA structuration, but they are complex. And the great morphological, ecological, and chromosomal diversity formed within the genetic complex needs further study to solve some taxonomic problems. And Rick will explain this this afternoon, I think. And in this slide, we can see that there is different economically important species that about, we can speak about quinoa used as grain crop, but also Quinopodium pallida coli, Quinopodium berlandieri, used both for grain and vegetable, and also Quinopodium album, used as leafy vegetable or foliage crop, and through some Ivarian tip, are uh, also cultivated for grain. And it's important to see the worldwide extension of all the species because all of them are relations. 
And we could see that uh, Kenopodium berlanderi is a similar species to Kenopodium quinoa, which is consumed in Mexico. And in the mountain of Himalaya, in India, in Nepal, in Bhutan, in China, there are also uh, cultivated Kenopodiaceae, classified as Kenopodium alblom, around an altitude of 1,500 meters and 3,000 meters. And also this Kenopodium album is a cosmopolitan weed in Europe. And it could be a difficulty for a French farmer to cultivate quinoa nowadays. But this Kenopodium album was part of human diet in this continent according to prehistoric human remains. So it's part of the uh, history of this part of the world in Europe. And the last thing is to show that uh, in this center of origin of quinoa near Lago Tiquicaca, there is also all the species of the complex of the quinoa who can give a new genus for the future of the quinoa. And it is important to consider all the complex of the genus of quinoa to understand the evolutionary dynamics of quinoa for the future. And not only quinopodium quinoa, as unique species. Quinoa, as you know, was domesticated near the lake Titicaca, between Peru and Bolivia. And we could see white parents and now the quinoa cultivated. But the important thing is that uh, domestication is a long and dynamic process. And the Infraspecific diversity, of course, is an invaluable asset created and maintained by all farmers in the world. And we need to consider these farmers in the world to the future of quinoa, not only to understand indigenous community in the Andes, but the other farmers in the world and how they can integrate quinoa and in cropping system and to create new diversity for these species in other parts of the world. And from how long have we been talking about conservation biodiversity in agriculture? From always, considering the role of farmers in the creation of cultivated biodiversity and permanent reproduction of agriculture production cycles. And only recently, if we, we look only at the ex situ collection of scientists. Less than 50 years. And why do we say that farmers are creators of diversity? Because they have domesticated white plants orienting the dynamics and they add to the diversity of crops through selection for plant adaptation to new ecosystem and human needs. And all those days, farmers would select individuals for the next generation and oriented the future of the species. And it's important to integrate them to the breeding. The diversity of cropland races is like an open metapopulation that allows the possibility of permanent evolution and adaptation to changes in environment context. And we need to consider this important thing to experiment quinoa in other parts of the world and not only to use a certified variety with a very small genetic base, but using land races with high possibility of adaptation. Genetic resources have been collected and exchanged for more than 10,000 years and spread over the planet with human migration. And now we could, we could find uh, some species in the Andes who are uh, who, who, come from uh, Medio Oriente. And there is a relation between all the countries of the world. And it's important to consider that country who cultivate some species today are not the same as yesterday. And I change this each day. And many improvements of the ecotype exist according to local context that determines the use and sowing of a high number of species and varieties. And 
agriculture has always been based on access and exchange. And agriculture has never been based on the exclusive principles observed today with the extension of property, property rights other the living world. And it's a new, new thing. And we need to, to think about it when we are thinking about uh, exchanges of jam plants. What is the future for agriculture? What is the future for farmers? And how farmers of, or in all of the parts of the world want to collaborate. Quinoa diversity at the continent scale has been associated with five main ecotypes in the islands, in Peru and Bolivia, in interurban valleys in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, in the Salares in Bolivia, Chile, and North Argentina, in the tropical part of Bolivia in the Yungas, and at sea level or coastal lowlands in Chile. And each of these ecotypes is associated with subcenter of diversity that comes from the surroundings of the Lake Titicaca. And it's, it's important to consider that all the migration, the people migration, could uh, generate new possibility of adaptation to these seeds and generate new diversity for the species. But uh, during the colonization of Spanish, quinoa was rejected and uh, was rejected since the colonization until the late uh, 20th century, considering quinoa as Indian food and is very recent the recognition of quinoa in Andean countries. In Santiago de Chile or in La Paz is very recent this recognition in the capital of the countries. Quinoa is cultivated for farmers, but in the cities it's different. And the boom of the quinoa at world level give, I mean, have an impact in the capital of the countries. And also, it, it was used as a religious drink, and this drink was rejected by the church. Schooling also changed eating pattern, and policy of agricultural, for agricultural modernization changed the structure of antenna, form of production, and there are many aspects from the colonization who looked at to, to decrease the diversity of quinoa. And it's important to consider it today to use this diversity and to maintain it. Because this high diversity in situ of quinoa is depending on some specific aspect of agrobiodiversity that need to be explained. Because to maintain agrobiodiversity, it's needed a human and active and a continuous management. And the value of agrogenetic resources is based as well on intraspecific diversity as in the number of species. So it's not interesting to develop a cropping system with only quinoa, but it's interesting to introduce quinoa in cropping system for its potential. And farmer contribute to increase diversity through production system and high diversity of practices. And both agricultural model have specific practices that can increase the diversity of one species with many varieties. And another thing is when a system is dying, diversity must be preserved ex situ. And it's important to consider the dynamics of the biocity to conserve this potential, the future. And countries and regions all over the world are interdependent and they are depending on cultivated plant native from or the region of the world. As you can see in this picture, the high diversity of quinoa can be seen in the field with many agromorphological variations due to biotic factors of interesting, interesting genetic diversity. This example from the north to south of Chile, near 3,000 kilometers, between the north and the south part of cultivated quinoa, 
we could see many difference, many morphological difference, many uh, biotic adaptation about uh, aridity, about salinity. And an important thing to be considered is that uh, consuming a variety of foods and dishes is the best guarantee for the conservation of the varietal diversity. Because if all the consumers want only one variety of quinoa, couldn't be able to save all this diversity. And maintaining a diversity of agricultural practices, maintaining a diversity of agriculture, maintain a variety of positive practices to maintain specific types of quinoa with adaptation or special characters. And, and it's important to maintain this diversity. Because we are in United States, I don't know if all of you know the context, the Andean context. I have three photographs, just a photo of quinoa from Valle in Peru to present the diversity of environments. Here is a photography of quinoa from Salares in the southern part of Bolivia. Mm, very arid. So here we have a photography of quinoa in the south part of Chile at sea level. And all of this context, in with all of this context, quinoa has a wide diversity, allowing it to adapt to different agroecological contexts and to tolerate extreme conditions, drought, salinity, frost. And this shows the potential for cultivation of other parts in the world. So we could leave the Andes to go outside. And it's why nowadays quinoa is living from the Andes, but uh, it's not new. From at least uh, 5,000 years ago until the beginning of the 80s, the Kenopodium quinoa grain has been specific to the Andean countries. In Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia, Chile, and Argentina. And, uh, but since the other countries understood the potential and benefit of quinoa, the amount of experimentation conducted did not stop growing. Even if the production of quinoa has always been highly represented in Bolivia and Peru, it started to spread across other continents in the 70s. And first, um, experimentation at, the, at that time United States first introduced quinoa in southern Colorado before it started spreading into other states and today quinoa is a growth in the plains of Saskatchewan and Ontario in Canada and participate to the global production because the extension are important but small compared to the volume sold in the United States which is imported from South America. And in Canada, quinoa is produced in plain like cereals and is sold in local market as grain and flour. The interest for quinoa out of the Indian region starts in North America in the 70s and 80s. And the first experimentation in Europe followed a few years later. And in England, quinoa is used as a cover crop alone or mixed with rapeseed. And in Denmark, quinoa has a great interest by people allergic to gluten. In Europe, Denmark and the Netherlands are important areas for quinoa improvement and breeding. And they developed the first European variety garment. And now part of research is linked on reducing the level of saponin and producing sweet variety like the variety Atlas. And it's important this part of breeding to consider the potential of uh, this new variety for temperate climate, temperate regions. And now in Brazil, in Umbrapa, for example, and University of the Midwest, a research is developed to use quinoa as a cover crop in winter, as in England. Huh? 
And in France, five years ago, farmers started growing quinoa through conventional agricultural practices within a cooperative in the west part of the country. And the organic production is not yet developed, representing only 5% of the sowing area. So in France, uh, quinoa, organic quinoa is imported and there is a production of conventional quinoa to, to dishes, to elaborate dishes for the agro-industry, not directed to sell to consumers. And this wish to expand the culture of quinoa is not yet finished. As a proof, more than 20 countries are looking forward to experimenting quinoa this year. So it's very important to consider this movement. And the heritage of the expansion are USA, Canada, and then Brazil, United Kingdom, New Zealand, India, China, and Australia. But now <coughs> the expansion of quinoa is more around the Mediterranean Sea and in Africa. But uh, as uh, Tania said, there is a big change in the new producing countries because they are not traditional consuming countries or importers. So there are two challenges for them using quinoa to diversify cropping system in saline and arid condition with the risk of loss of their local agrobiodiversity. And the version to promoting, promoting quinoa into the country for food security or exporting quinoa with the risk of competition on markets with Indian countries. And we need to consider it. The multiplication and the spread of experimental station and station are directly linked to major international initiative of research. And the cooperation created around quinoa has been underlined in three miles that explain three steps of the extension. And the first introduction of quinoa in Europe began in 78, with Japas coming from Chile, from University of Conception in the central part of Chile was collected, selected, and tested by Colin Leake in Cambridge. And then the Chilean jam plus with the Indian jam plus collected in 82 by uh, Nick Galway, conduced to a, where the based base of the breeding program of the University of Cambridge with the help of Peruvian colleagues. And from Cambridge, quinoa was distributed to Denmark, to Holland, and many other countries, as you can see in this map. Another step of this dissemination of quinoa is during the 90s. And in 93, it would correspond to the first European Union project was initiated with field trials in England, Denmark, Netherlands, Italy, as well as laboratory tests in Scotland and France. But the most important project during the 90s was that explained quinoa worldwide expansion is a project which began in 96 with the Danish Internal Development Agency, Danida, and the International Potato Center, SIP in Peru. There were field trials in new countries, such as Sweden, Poland, and Czech Republic, Australia, Germany, Italy, and Greece. And all of them have shown interest in quinoa experimentation, and most of them are involved in the European and American test of quinoa organized by the FAO. To, to understand, to, to create a state of art of quinoa based on multiple experimentation. And now the SwoopMap project, coordinated by Sven Jacobsen, corresponds to the last important step of quinoa expansion, because in the, with the SwoopMap project, the SwoopMap project partners represent countries from the European Union, Italy, Portugal, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Denmark, and from Mediterranean countries, Turkey, Morocco, Egypt, Syria. And it's important to consider that all international collaboration give the future of quinoa, because all the difficulties to access to GermPlus is different when we can develop an international collaboration and international project. But we will come again about discussion about germplasm.
because the spread of worldwide quinoa is made from strong relationship between institutions that share their genetic material. And as you can see, the Indian country holds the largest Jamplas collection. But there is many countries in many parts of the world who have Jamplas collection of quinoa. There are more than 25 countries who have a collection of quinoa all around the world. And uh, they established collection prior to the signature of the Convention of Bio Biological Diversity, which specifies that states are sovereign over the genetic resources. So that means that this country may well develop new varieties from the Jamplas without having to refer to the country of origin. So it's very important to, it's very relevant for Indian countries. If these countries need, so these countries need to be very active in the international agenda of quinoa to protect their genetic resources and interests because very many cases all around the world where there is jamplas of quinoa who can be used to develop the future of quinoa without collaboration with Indian countries. As we saw in, with this picture, quinoa is living from the Andes, but what king of genetic material is now being used for the expansion of quinoa? And one problem is the, because there is an imbalanced technology access between the north and the south. Because all the countries, the Indian countries or African countries don't want access to um, molecular markers and it's difficult for them to, to develop a breeding program with a selection based on gen of interest. And the international collaboration is very important to give access to all this biotechnology of this country if we want to collaborate at international level. And other thing about this, uh, balance of biotechnology is the geographic expansion of quinoa is also improving the number of plant variety rights into action in worldwide and it's important to consider the restriction to access and to to uh, to, <coughs> to so again next year this variety with within this restriction and but there are also countries more considered as breeders and producers and asking for new plant variety rights like Israel, Denmark, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Canada, Peru, Chile. And there is, also, there is uh, 20 plant variety rights at world level. And uh, the country where this protection are into action are in the European Union, in Canada, in Peru, and in Chile for the moment. So I come back to the main objective of the International Year for Quinoa to focus work attention on the potential of quinoa biodiversity in food security, nutrition, and poverty eradication. So as we are in the International Year for Quinoa, we have chosen to present various aspects of the wide diversity of quinoa and its global expansion, but what's active now with research on quinoa. Tania presents a graphic about uh, the importance of quinoa research during the last 20 years. And I, I made a similar work during the last six months. I, I want to present this result as a conclusion of my presentation. As we have seen with the expansion of quinoa world level, the number of research centers on quinoa is increasing worldwide. And in parallel, the number of researchers working on quinoa is expanding, even in regions on Africa. Western Europe or Central America, which are not yet producing quinoa. And if we make a zoom about uh, Europe, we can see that uh, 
um, there is many and many more also from different countries all over the world. And the uh, consequence is the augmentation, the increasing of the number of publications. And Europe is one part of this future of quinoa research. But one thing I can add to the graph of Tanya is the number of publications on the country. Here we can see that uh, if we have the cycle about 100, 100 publications are, con are concerning about this country. And if we consider uh, this, well, today the main concern in countries of research and study are still the first producer of quinoa. So many research are in uh, South America. But there is other part of the world, and as we can see, there is a big gap in the knowledge on Africa, for example. And this could be one of the challenges for the international year of Kino and after, if you want to increase the chances of its, its, its introduction and development there. Because if we haven't got any publication, any research publication about the difficulty to introduce, to experiment Kino in this part of the world, it could be very dangerous to give seed to the, to the farmers. And uh, if we consider the, main, the eight main topics of research in the last publication, it appears that near 25% of the publication are about biology, not about agronomy directly. And there is about 10% of publication about nutrition and dietetics, about agronomy, botanic and vegetal physiology, food science, and over part of research as water and soil resources, genetic and heredity are less uh, developed. And I think it's very important to consider it for the next researches because we need a group of experts at world level on quinoa able to contest the wide needs of research linked to the, its expansion and to the actual worldwide interests in many domains. So we are in 2013 from Rio in 92. Several international treaties were signed that applied to the management of plant genetic resources. And there are today many questions and other challenges for the future of quinoa. And they need to be discussed in depth to associate all the actors and countries in the debate about benefits of quinoa for all. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>